Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining me today. I'm very honored to have Ken Lee, who's a photographer, who also does a variety of different types of workshops. So we're going to chat about travel, photography, his passions, and, and all of that. So welcome, Ken. Oh, thanks, April. It's great to be here. So what originally inspired you to create with a camera? Oh, there's a, there's a whole story, but it, it really goes back to... Uh... When I was in high school, I uh, it was my senior year. I was just looking for an easy class to take, and I ended up signing up for journalism. And I chose to be a photographer, even though I didn't have a camera. And I uh, so I asked my parents uh, if I could have a camera for my birthday. It was coming up, and they said yes. And then we bought this Canon AE one program, and uh, this book called. The joy of photography and it was really more the book than the camera that i made me fall in love with photography i i started flipping through it and i never looked at pictures this way before I, I, like these pictures were you know some of the great you know from the masters and and they were uh very moving and i and you know before until then it was photography for me the idea of photography was where you would just um you know record moments and you know family gatherings and birthdays and things like that and and these these pictures just really you know inspired me hit me and uh, that's really where i fell in love with it um later and later on i i did end up going to photography school a place called brooks institute and then um uh did a number of i did some commercial work and ended up um, opening a gallery in colorado and i had that for a number of years and then more recently, I've switched over to these uh, travel workshops. Yeah, so tell us a bit about the travel workshops. When I was perusing your website, I came across horseback riding and photography. And my mind is like, I'm <laughs> envisioning the old Ansel Adams. He's got this, all this gear, the, the horses, you know, weighted down. And I'm like, wow, how is this going to work? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a little bit of what inspired me because where we go it's all in the sierra nevada mountains of california and that's that's ansel adams country that's exactly yeah. where all his work um and so um a while back i had this idea i i'd, I'd done a lot of backpacking in my earlier years and I, I just knew how beautiful it was in in the mountains but it also was like it's torture even if you're in young and good shape okay, good. <laughs> to, uh, to, to carry all your stuff on your back you know over some yeah. mountain path and it's literally torture and uh and a lot of my my clients are older and uh i just knew that that would never work so i started thinking about uh, uh horse packing outfits and I, I contacted a few and you know eventually made contact with one and that was back in 2015 wow and we've done oh god maybe you're close to 30 trips at this point um and I, at this point i've got four different um workshops that are uh, horseback based but photography focused i guess would be the best way to say it is uh, we use the horses to get to where we need to get to and and it's also you know just a big part of the experience itself but then um you know the rest of the time we're focused on on making images so talk a little bit about where the work, uh, the workshops and the horses take you. Cause I would imagine with the horses, uh -huh. some of the vistas you're able to see are things that, you know, you're not going to be able to drive to, you know, you might be able to get some different things. Yeah. I mean, the, the, both ways is uh, just sitting on top of the horse itself is it's a different perspective. You know, you're up higher and you kind of see over everything and, that's amazing in itself also you know where we go basically there are no roads and the only way to get back is either on foot or or on horseback and so i've got um the next trip is that's coming up is in uh june and it's our wild mustangs of the adobe valley trip and that's really one of my favorites because I, I that's that was the very first workshop i did on horseback and so we go it's it's near the town of bishop um uh, california oh, okay. some people might have heard of 
that or our, our mammoth uh, um, mountain uh, mammoth lakes it's kind of right in that area and um there's some wild horses out there and we go out and photograph the horses and ride among the horses the the mustangs uh it's it's pretty amazing uh <laughs> so wow. I, it's I call it wild horses and mountain landscapes so there's a landscape uh photography component of it but really the focus is on on these wild horses and then um i've got a couple of others that are and this this is more in the valley in, in the valley floor between the sierra nevada and the white mountains and then we have a couple trips that we do where we're actually in the middle of the, the sierra nevada and you know this is it's it's literally you know sierra club calendar um, yeah locations it's it's exactly that and it's you know, it's it's freaking beautiful back there. It's, yeah, you know, you're, yeah. It's, you know, like, I mean, it's like w Yosemite without people. And right, uh, yeah. And so we take uh, horses and mules, and they bring us in. We set up camp. Um, they they take the horses down the valley a little bit to graze, and then we'll do day rides every day. So usually, you know, we get we get up, you know, right by this beautiful mountain lake. We we do some um, early morning photography and, you know, then have some breakfast, maybe some kind of little lecture kind of thing. And then they'll bring the horses and they'll go out, explore for the day and then come back. It's, a, it's pretty awesome. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> so you have people cook for you. You have people set up camp for you. Yep. So... Um, yeah, they, they, they provide tents. It, it is camping, you know, so um it is you know that's the first uh, question people ask like you know about bathrooms and showers and like mm. i say imagine a pop-up porta potty with the wooden toilet inside <laughs> <laughs> and no showers well actually on on the mustangs one we do actually have they, they've rigged up something that uh, it works and it's it's actually hot water uh, hot shower oh, there really but, yeah yeah um but but the uh, the other one no and um yeah, uh, so it's 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 you know it's you that's that's the other thing that is a great subject uh, on these workshops is the the uh, the cooks and the wranglers and the you know the the packers these guys are are real cowboys and um, you know and and cowgirls are there are a lot of women that do this and and you know they just make awesome um subjects for i was just gonna say that my mind is just envisioning them you know over this old camp stove and the uh -huh. steam and smoke and yeah, yeah so there's actually a multitude of types of subject matter for your eye and yeah i mean uh depending on which trip you go on so the the, the mustangs trip obviously the focus is on the horses and then the the other um, sierra trips they are more you know focused on landscape and and also night photography and then uh and then we also do you know some like i said uh what i call western lifestyle you know the cowboys and cowgirls and you know horses and all of that and yeah it there's no you know shortage of material out there yeah so you've just really fallen in love with the whole being on the horse being out there it's not, you know, i have and I, I found that like you know a lot, a lot of people really like this idea so you know we've been selling out these trips you know for years now and um and so we keep expanding because people you know keep you know wanting to to come so we have a uh this year we actually had a, a spring uh wildflowers uh oh. one that we had to cancel because they just got too much snow there you know the, i was the, just yeah i was just thinking that yeah yeah, so we've uh, we switched that out for another uh, Mustangs workshop. But then normally we have a spring one, uh, summer, so it's like kind of August time frame, and then uh, a fall colors ride that we do in, in late October, and then and then and the Mustangs one also that's in the spring, which is it, it's beautiful with the snow capped mountains and you know, we've got uh, newborn foals and, you know, <laughs> oh, yeah. it's, it's nice heard out there. So it's, 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 you know, you got the stallions all rearing up and fighting and all this stuff. It's just, you know, amazing the, uh, the scene. So how many people do you take on these workshops? It, it depends. Uh, so the most is 12, which is the Mustangs uh, workshop because it just works out that that's a good number. Yeah. Group. Uh, some of the other ones are limited by like uh, how many people you can have by permit uh, in, mm. in, 
because it's a uh what do you call it say it's, it's uh, the blm property isn't uh, it it's uh it's wilderness it's national forest uh wild, wilderness so you know there's um there's limits on how many people i think we have 11 on that one um and usually about that number and then some of my other workshops it it, it just varies you know it could be as few as as three or four and then oh nice yeah maybe 12 is probably about as many as i ever do would you say that um you need to be an accomplished photographer or is it you can be a beginner on this talk a little bit about what kind of skills you need to have sure there, there's no uh particular uh level of photography of photographer that you have to be or, or level of experience that you need to have so my, my company's called art of seeing and i chose that name because um what i you know my personal uh philosophy or approach to teaching photography is that there's there's two sides there's really two different you know halves of photography if you, if you will and one is the, the the craft and technical side and it's you know that's all the half stops and shutter speeds and lenses and and photoshop you know all that stuff and that's super important and super necessary and um especially in in recent years there have been you know, huge advances in this area and, 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 you know, the equipment is, is phenomenal, yeah. but really ultimately it's only half the equation. The other half is, you know, what you point the camera at, right. right. And yeah. Yeah. And, and learning to recognize what's going to translate uh, well into a photograph and then, and then, you know, kind of trying to be able to produce your, your vision, you know, to create that. That's the other side that is, you know, everybody acknowledges, but nobody really, you know, teaches in a, in a, in a methodical way or, you know, you know, in a, in a practical way, you know, it's more like, it's either like rule of thirds or, <laughs> um, you know, or like, you know, just get in touch with your feelings or something like that. And, 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 and you know, I don't, I don't think that's it. You know, I think there's a lot more to it. I think it can be approached a lot more uh, systematically and practically. And therefore, I think there's something, uh, you know, to be gained regardless of where you are in your, you know, photographic journey. Um, you know, if you're, if you're gonna sign up for a wildlife uh, workshop, you know, it, it does help to have a little bit of, you yeah. know, you know, if you're opening the box. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> as you pull into, uh, to get on the horse, then, you know, we had a little bit of work ahead of us, but uh, but there's you know there's plenty of of YouTube videos out there to to help people you know with their camera controls and stuff. And I'm I'm and I'm I'm happy to do that. I, it's not that I don't um, appreciate that half of it. Uh, in fact, the reason I'm so kind of passionate about this approach is because I am more of like a, a technical person by nature. Oh, okay bit of a you know geek and and you know the the, the shutter speeds and the f-stop all that stuff came pretty naturally to me it didn't you know I didn't have to struggle too much to understand that but in the end I realized you know my my pictures were were, were technically perfect maybe but they were perfectly boring too mm -hmm. and there was no uh, you know they, they didn't have any of that quality yeah. that inspired me to become a photographer and so um you know I had to learn that that uh that this this art of seeing this you know people say it's composition but it's more than just composition it's be able to recognize what you know what's a good photo and to see light and all these kind of things um you know that was learning that part of it is really what turned the corner for me or made the biggest difference in my photography so you know that's what I tried to talk about a lot uh but I'm happy to you know dive into you know whatever you know <laughs> dynamic range you know the chit chat you know inevitably ends up you know talking about different lenses and and you know specific photoshop or lightroom techniques and masking and all these things and we cover yeah. a lot of that but uh but i also always try to you know bring in hey yeah you know, the first thing is you got to have a you got to have something to take a, a picture of right and, right you know, and like it, as smart as cameras are today you know, there's not any that will tell you, you know, no, a little to the left, dummy. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I was just saying, like, true. no, why, you know, why are you taking that picture? That's what they should be asking, you know. But uh, 
maybe you know with uh, AI and all that that's coming around, maybe you know that maybe the next camera will tell me you know a little bit. <laughs> to the left dummy yeah, yeah but, exactly you know, are you sure you want to use that lens or something like that but you know we're not there yet um so uh at this point you know uh, you have to do it yourself so um so it doesn't matter your your uh ability level uh one of the things i like to to you know one of my favorite i don't know tricks or tools that i use is is actually the camera phone so you know um I think that the phone is the best tool to teach photographers how to see because there is there's nothing technical about phone photography. Right. right? You know, you turn right. on the app and you know that you point and shoot literally. So you can't hide behind the technical, right? You can't right. sit there and go, okay, well, this camera, this picture might not be great, but well, I'm going to do HDR and focus <laughs> stacking. And, you know, uh, you know, whatever, blah, 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 and long exposures, you know, and, and you know, think that you're going to produce something later. Um, you know, it's really you and the image. And, you know, if you can learn to take good pictures with your phone camera, then, then, you know, that is really, you know, it's really based on learning how to see and it's, it's what you put in the frame. So uh, I encourage people to use phones and bring uh, phone cameras, you know, on our workshops. Uh, it's a great scouting tool. You know, I'll walk around the lake up in the mountains and kind of like point it at different scenes and, you know, kind of move it up and down and see where, um, you know, what you know, composition or is going to work the best. Yeah, I think that's a great tip um, about the cell phones because I kind of view that the same way. They're kind of like, for those of us who are a little bit older and remember a Polaroid, you know, you take a quick Polaroid sometimes just to visualize, you know, how the model is standing or how the light's hitting them. And the yes. cell phone, it pretty much is like a kind of a pre viewfinder, kind of set it up. And <laughs> it is, it's, it's ironic because, you know, our, our, our digital cameras really are the same thing, right? And you can yeah. do that. Um, and just look at it, you know, you know, nowadays with mirrorless, you can look at it in camera or you can look, you know, snap a photo and bring it, bring it up uh, on your screen afterwards. But for some reason, it's, it seems to be different. I think there's a certain, like, I don't know, yeah, gravitas to, <laughs> to the, uh, to the bigger camera, right? To your yeah. Ours mirrorless cameras where it's like, oh, is this worthy of me taking a photo? Or worthy of me like actually breaking it up? So, you know, but, you know, it's all, it's, you can always just reach in your pocket and, and you know, stick your phone out there. And, um, you know, so if you, I just encourage people to take the process uh, just as seriously um, as if you had your big camera, right? So, you know, you probably wouldn't with with your larger camera. You probably wouldn't just take one picture. You'd probably take multiple, you know, variations, and you probably spend more more time composing and looking at things and checking, you know, the the corners and edges of your frame and things like that. And you know, if you just approach it the same way, you know, there's no there's no quality issue at this point, right? Like, right, yeah. <laughs> like, well, what if I get a good picture? Or, you know, what if there's a great scene? I'm like, well, then you've got a great picture because. Yeah. You know, these, you know, iPhone and Android camera, um, you can make big prints, you can do all these things that people think you can't do. And you can certainly, you know, uh, post online, you know, I've got all kinds of um, shots on my website, and different social media and things that were shot on, on my iPhone. And, you know, people ask me, you know, which ones, you know, are they? And I say, well, you tell me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. You, tell, then, you know, what difference does it make? And, you know, ultimately, yeah, there is, I'm not saying it's the same, you know, there, there's, a, there's a reason why, you know, the higher end, you know, Sony's and Canon's, you know, they cost, you know, three, four, five thousand dollars or whatever. You know, they're, they're, yeah, they're, you know, they're not the same. The, you know, iPhone is not the same, but it's, it's like saying, you know, what's the best tool, you know, a wrench or a screwdriver kind of depends on, you know, what the task is at hand. And so, you know, sometimes the, uh, you know, the, <laughs> the iPhone is kind of like the Swiss army knife and can do most of, you know, you can, right. you can do a lot, you can do a lot, you know, you're not going to do um, wildlife photography, you're not going to do like really <laughs> night photography yet you know right right it's <laughs> so some of them are getting pretty close <laughs> yeah, sure. you know you you know so it's, it's all about um 
you know, it's not all, it's a, a big part of photography is, you know, what you point your camera at and learning to understand what works uh, well and, and learning to actually see, you know, your photograph more as a design than as what it is. So instead of like, oh, I'm taking a picture of a lake or of a tree or of a mountain or whatever, you know, you learn to see it more as shapes and tones and and kind of trust that that side of you that is very, you know, that's that's that learn that knows how to judge pictures because all of us, no matter how long we've been doing photography, it's like you knew what a good photograph was. Yeah. Before you ever became a photographer, right? You probably couldn't explain it. You couldn't, you know, but everybody, you know, look at Instagram. It's not Instagram is not a community of you know, trained photographers is just, you know, really it's yeah. just public. And, you know, people recognize when they see a good photo, right? Yeah. So those ones, they, you know, they get the, you know, thousands of likes and things right. like that because, because they're spectacular images and they're stunning. And there's nobody told them that, you know, these are the rules or whatever. You just instinctively know what a good photograph is. And I think it's more about tapping into that side of us and and looking at for some reason all this goes offline when you do your own photography when somebody hands you a photo you know their a picture that they took or or whatever instantly you know whether it's any good or not right right and right. really the rest of the time you're figuring out how to be polite right yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know? and it, it's it's a microsecond and we just and there's no like comparing it to um rules or anything like that right it's just you instinctively know in in a flash and but when we do our own photography we somehow lose touch with that and we start telling ourselves stories and 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 you know well, why we're doing this and the meaning of that blah blah and then you see like oh that beautiful mountain now oh, i need to have that in there oh that beautiful tree i need to have that in there oh there's a beautiful rock so and the light over on that bush and 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 you're thinking it rather than seeing it at that point and the problem but the problem is, is you're there's a that side of your brain that's good at thinking sucks at design yeah <laughs> and it sucks at photography but we end up listening to that side of ourselves and and that's and and then you get these pictures that are you know just nothing not interesting and you're trying to tell your friends how it was so much more beautiful than what <laughs> than your picture. <laughs> yeah. Show it, right? Yeah, that's 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 happened to all of us, right? And so, you know, uh, I, I keep going back to, you know, it's it's what you put in it, what's in learning how to see it as a photo, uh, as you would somebody else's uh, picture. Yeah. Oh, and I love the I love the name of your website, Art of Seeing. I think that yeah. encompasses quite a lot. But getting back to the uh, horseback riding a little bit, is there yeah. Things that, you know, do people need to be pretty comfortable riding a horse? Are there other things they should think about to prep for that trip, do you think? You know, it, yeah, it's, as with everything, you know, having some experience is good, but we get a lot of uh, novice riders, you know, that's the, actually the first, you know, the most common question is, you know, how yeah. right? and you, you technically you don't, you know, you don't need any uh, horseback riding experience, but <laughs> Having said that, uh, especially the mountain trips, this is no like, you know, Sunday county fair, you know, pony ride. Right. <laughs> yeah, we're in the mountains and, you know, we're doing these, we're going on these, on these trails uh, that have some big drop-offs. Yeah. You know, if, if you're extremely afraid of heights, I'd say maybe it's not the, the, the but it's not the trip for you. But, um, but other than that, uh, as long as you know you're of you know just normal physical condition um, um you know if after a long day of riding it, it is normal to be a little bit sore <laughs> that's not you know, yeah. honest but but it goes away quickly it, you know like really like 20 minutes later people are yeah you know, they're just talking you know they're like they're not you know they're not moving all funny anymore right <laughs> um, so it's, it's temporary um we don't do anything, you know, uh, everything's kind of at a walking pace, right? So there's no galloping, there's no running these horses, you know, at the most, 
you know, if there's a, a little gap opens up between you and the and the, the next horse, then your horse might trot a few steps to catch up. That's about it. Um, and that's the way, like, you know, we keep it that way, you know, for safety purposes. And yeah, but yeah. you know, the, the 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 like I said, the 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 terrain that we cover, you know, I have a lot of people that have ridden horses their whole life. And they tell me like, you know, Ken, I've, I've never been on a trail like that. You know? Oh, really? Oh, wow. Yeah. You know, so it's, it's, it's the real deal, but it's not, you don't need a yeah. ton of experience, you know, you don't need, and you know, they, these uh, outfitters that we work with, um, uh, shout out to Rock Creek Pack Station and Bitch yeah. Shepherd. Uh, yeah, they're an amazing outfit. They just, you know, they're just, they've done this for so long and they know how to take people into the wilderness on horseback and do it safely. And um, yeah, so I, I rely on them a lot too. And as far as packing, I'm sure there's some tips for people on packing because nobody <laughs> should shy, nobody <laughs> should show up with like, you know. Well, okay, you can leave the hair dryer behind. Yep. Um, you know, uh, certain, so you have to pack light. Uh, the Mustangs trip, it's not such a weight critical thing, you know, there's a, a limit but there's a lot of flexibility uh the other uh mountain trips there we have a 35 pound uh what's called dunnage which is all your luggage so if it's not on your body then you have 35 pounds worth of gear that you can bring that includes your camera gear and that includes your camera i was uh, just gonna say yeah, cause... <laughs> for the non-photography trips it's 30 pounds <laughs> so oh. we've negotiated uh and you know there's a little little fudge you know a little room uh you know, if you're like a pound over, they're not gonna, you know, throw yeah. out or anything. But uh, but you know, you got to be somewhere close to that thirty-five pounds. But the, I'll tell you, you know, I have suggestions, and then um, you know, Rock Creek has a packing list that we put out there. Nice, and, okay. And um, yeah, you know, it uh, they provide uh, all the tents and stuff like that, so that doesn't include like uh, tents and things like that. Um, yeah, so um, you have to you have to be limited, but everyone, all I can say is like, you know, we've done hundreds uh, or hundreds yeah. of people have done this trip at this point, and somehow they've all managed to, you know, I, I get a lot of calls before and saying, you know, I'm, I'm waiting my stuff and I just can't get there, you know, <laughs> no. and, yeah. uh, and uh, you know, uh, just, you know, we just kind of walk, talk them through it and, you know, get them as close as possible and then it somehow all works out. Yeah. So what, what kind of gear is in your camera bag? Because everyone always wants to know. I know in the end, it, uh -huh. is, it is the quality of the picture, but we all often are curious, you know, which cameras you're using well, right now. And Yeah, and I'll, I'll be, you know, honestly, I will, uh, when I started, you know, teaching, um, I used to be very much like, it's not about the gear at all, right? Like, right. It, doesn't, it doesn't matter. And, you know, I've come to realize that's, that's not true. You know, I mean, like, I'm the first guy, you know, when the new Sony is announced, which is what I shoot now, you know, I'm all over the websites. I'm, you know, like yeah. checking specs and, 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 you know, deciding when am I going to purchase this thing and all this kind of stuff. And I get, I get sucked into that, you know, that gear, uh, whatever the gear, envy, gear lust, you know, yeah. all of that. And, and, and you know, for a lot of things, it does matter, you know, so, you know, if you're doing a lot of night photography, you know, uh, you pay more money, you get a better uh, camera in terms of noise performance, right. or, uh, you know, the, the, the high-end mirrorless, I mean, they've just, they're just changed the game in wildlife photography, you know, they, uh, so yeah, so to, to get back to your question, I, I shoot Sony these days, um, I, I, I recently moved up to the, the A1, which is kind of their top of the line camera, uh, because I've been doing a lot more wildlife photography and, you know, the uh, the eye focus, the animal eye focus. Oh my gosh. That has really, uh, yeah, that's changed things tr tremendously. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a major change. It's amazing yeah, yeah. what these cameras, these tools can do now for us. That Yeah, so, um, yeah, I mean, if you look inside my bag, you won't find a bunch of cheap off-brand stuff. You know, <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, so gear is important. So I acknowledge that, and and um, I, I I tend to uh, I tend to favor Zoom. So 
uh, I, I grew up, my passion early on was landscape photography in the mountains. And like I said, I would have to backpack in. So size and weight yeah. have always played a big light, a big role in what I uh, choose for my equipment. So um, even though in some cases, primes, you know, maybe sharper, I don't know, you know, there may yeah. be some of the that would be faster or whatnot. Uh, I, I I usually carry all zooms. Uh, I think the, the the quality is is out is is good now. So, in what like four lenses? Uh, in four lenses, I can cover from twelve millimeters out past six hundred millimeters. Oh, you know, nice, nice. Without, without any kind of gaps in the focal length there. You know, four like a twelve to twenty-four. Um, 24, 105, 8200, and one, uh, 200 to 400 or 200 to 600, um, which is the lens that made me switch over from Canon <laughs> to Sony. Is like, I got tired of waiting for Canon to come out yep. with their mirrorless, um, and and then they Sony came out with this amazing um, dream lens as far as wildlife for me. It was that 200 to 600. So I and that's a Sony lens, then, right? Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. I jumped ship and went over to. to uh, Sony and you know it uh eventually of course you know Canon really got into the this game and they've got some amazing cameras now Nikon's got amazing cameras I, I don't think there's like one company that dominates anymore for a while Sony did have a yeah big uh head start on everybody and I still think they probably got the you know most complete lens lineup um but you know, there's been you know, there. I still feel like I can get around a Canon menu better than I can a Sony one. Any any everything that you hear bad about the Sony menus is true for the most part. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, they they've changed them recently and it's gotten a lot better. But like the first Sony camera I bought, I, I couldn't remember. I could never figure out where format was. You know, and I would have to like every time I wanted to format a card, I'd have to spend ten minutes you know, scrolling through menu after menu to figure it out. I ended up putting it into a, a shortcut because- Right, <laughs> yeah, I know. I didn't remember where they stuck it because it was buried some weird place. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's it. Um, you know, I, I'm big on uh, tripods, um, not just, uh, you know, I say like holding your camera still is the second job of a tripod. And the first job of the tripod is to slow you down and make you work more methodically, you know, and, and, you know, like with a tripod, you can make very small adjustments from one picture to the next. You can kind of step away from the camera and, you know, give yourself a little distance. That's another, another um, tip I have is for composition, you want, the composition is essentially seeing the forest and not the trees. Right? And seeing the overall picture, the shapes and the tones and the colors, and not so much about, you know, exactly what's in your picture. So the, you want to see less detail, not more, in, in my way of thinking, uh, when you're doing that part of your photography, when you're doing the composition. So, you know, even though we have these big, beautiful displays on the back of our cameras, I, I will do things to make the image smaller somehow. And sometimes like, like, what I mean is like, if you bring up the histogram, your little preview image shrinks a long mm -hmm. time. Right? Yeah. And I would bring up the histogram, not really to look at the histogram, but just to make my image smaller. And just so I see less detail, or I will physically step back two or three steps and, and look at the back of my screen. So it's just smaller in my, my field of view. And, you know, that's also applies to when you're doing your picks later on instead of, you know, blowing up the image to full size, you know, uh, a single image and then scrolling through one after another, I, I'd say, you know, start with thumbnails and look at a page of thumbnails and just scan quickly. Don't, don't, don't spend too much time. Give yourself maybe two or three seconds per page of thumbnail and just pick the ones, just tag the ones that jump out at you, you know, and don't bother looking whether it's sharp or not at this point, just you know, quickly go through and the ones that jump out at you, you know, that, that, that look good on first instinct and that look good small, you know, without a lot of detail, those are usually your strongest compositions. That's really, those are some great tips. <laughs> and especially, I think that is the, the issue with um, 
you know, digital photography, it's, it's such a quick learning tool, but we also yeah. end up with thousands of images where if any of us that have started yeah. with film, like you and I, it's like, you had to like really think like, is it worth paying, oh, yeah. you know, <laughs> taking this picture? I'm going to have to pay to process it. I mean, all of that, you. Yeah. But the, the, I, I think for sure digital has, you know, shortened or, or flattened yeah. the, the learning curve so much. Right. Oh because, yeah. Uh, you, because of that immediate feedback, you know, right. and, and because you see it. And so, uh, you know, take advantage of that, right? I, you know, there's so many good photographers out there that, you know, ha have learned and have been self-taught now. Uh, and, and I think a big part of that is because, you know, for the people that are willing to get out there and, and shoot, you know, and then learn, you know, look at your pictures. That's a, the other thing. I think a lot of people, there's this hesitancy to actually look at your own images in the, in the moment, right? Like, like you click, and I hear people say, well, I hope that turns out. And I, and, <laughs> and I say, like, what do you mean? Like when you pick it up from the drugstore, you're like, look, right. you know, like, you're like, look at it, you know, tell me, did it turn out right now? You know, yeah. in the moment? and, and, you know, like, what do you mean? Like how maybe after post-processing, I, I guess is, is one way of thinking at it, but, but really it's, you know, it's right there. And, and people there's, I don't know, there's something, um, inside of us that makes you kind of not want to like look at it you know people look at their pictures like oh did it turn out like is it the right brightness you know is it sharp right those right. they look at technical aspects but they don't really look at their picture aesthetically or compositionally you know like is this a good picture you know uh, and they they think for some reason they put that decision off to a later time when I sit down in front of my computer I'm like no 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 you know look at your picture you know and just try to you know try to listen to that first instinct yeah. is this something that goes like ooh something that makes you say ooh you know right. they're like ooh I'm excited about this I want to you know I can't wait to get this back on the computer kind of thing right if you don't have that chances are that it's not <laughs> you know it's not yeah. that right and, and the truth is that, you know, no matter who you are, most of your pictures, you know, the great majority of the pictures you ever take in your life aren't going to be exciting. You know, like the great photographers don't take amazing photos every single time. It doesn't happen like that. Uh, um, so, you know, the, but if you evaluate it in the moment, you still have the opportunity to change something, right? right. To, to reshoot it to, you know, like, why, you know, like, Oh, I know the scene is beautiful. Like objectively, I'm looking, you know, standing at the edge of the Grand Canyon and I'm just going, you know, this is freaking amazing. And like, does my picture reflect that? And if it doesn't, then why not? And, you know, you know, what should I do different? You know, try, you know, it's like, what is it that's not, you know, getting it there? But I think too often people just kind of click, you know, maybe they might check sharpness and then they walk away. You know, so. Yeah. Do you have any tips for people that are maybe not sure that they're ready to get a, a larger camera? You know, they've been taking a lot of cell phone photos and they have this curiosity what yeah, kind of, I, I to kind of say, push them to the next level. And <laughs> yeah, I mean, first, you know, I would say keep shooting with your phone, right? Because that's an amazing camera. So in my way of thinking, you know, my iPhone covers something like the, you know, the 35 millimeter equivalent of like 12 millimeters to, you know, yeah. 90 millimeters or something like that. So if there's a picture that I, I would use a lens in that focal length range, I, I, I have no, uh, com you know, no hesitation to go ahead and just take that with, with my iPhone, you know, um, and I don't feel like I'm, you know, sacrificing much. Yeah. Uh, so, a take you know, keep keep shooting with your phone, okay? And if, and then B, I, I'm not one of these people that says you know like you have to have a full frame uh, you know, DSLR. I think there's lots of options out there. You know, um, I know lots of people that have bought you know uh, DSLRs and then left them in their car. You know, <laughs> it's some amazing. You know, they're like, oh, I went to this place. And it was amazing, but then you know we went on this hike. But I left the I left the you know camera in my car because I didn't want to carry the damn thing. So if you're not willing to carry it, same thing with the tripod. You know, I grew up 
uh, being taught, you know, to to get the heaviest tripod out that you can carry. And but if you're if you're not going to carry it, then it does you no good. So, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit more practical that way. Uh, I think the uh, mirrorless, I mean, the uh, Micro Four Thirds, is is a great platform. I think there's there's brands like Fuji and Olympus that are just doing like amazing. Uh, really cool things with their cameras, like things that you don't see, uh, you know, even on on the, some of the SLRs uh, or the bigger brands. Um, yeah, and and then you know, I tell people the 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 cheapest entry level, you know, most basic, you know, Canon Rebel or whatever the you know the entry level camera on each of these manufacturer lines is would run circles around. The camera that I used when I had my gallery and was selling prints. Oh, <laughs> isn't that amazing? Uh, so I mean, you know, you can't go wrong, really. You know, you know, yeah, you can't go wrong. You know, it's 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 more about uh, budget, right? You know, and and what you know, the type of photography you want to do and what you're willing to carry. You know, if you have, if you're a skier and you get out to like amazing backcountry, you know, you might want to have a camera with you, but you're you know, you, you're already carrying skis <laughs> and, and everything else, you know, for skiing, you know, so, or if you're, you know, to fishing or whatever, you know, so you, you know, maybe the big, you know, DSLR full frame camera is not the right choice because it's just too bulky, you know, it's like too much stuff to carry, you know, um, and even some of these kind of uh, what they call bridge cameras, right, they're, they're like a, between a point and shoot and an SLR, yeah. they're, they're amazing too. So yeah, think about, you know, obviously budget, then, you know, what you're going to use it for, what you're willing to do, what you're willing to carry, you know, and, um, and then, you know, go from there. So what's next for you, Ken? Cause, uh, and what kind of keeps you motivated <laughs> to keep going back to some of these locations? Because for well, you, they're just, they're spectacular. I mean, like, you know, I don't get tired of going out into the Sierras or out photographing wild horses that, it's, you know, it does become less, you know, I mean, after you've done it a bunch of times, it's just like becomes familiar, right? Right. And, you know, but, and I, I kind of, you know, almost go through the motions until I'm actually on top of the horse. And then I'm like, oh my God. And now I remember why I, I you know, I do this stuff. Um, and I love uh, discovering, you know, new travel is a passion. I have a theory that, you know, a lot of us fall in love with traveling. It, it's not so much because of the beauty of one particular location or, or another is, is that when you travel, when you see a place for the first time, you really see, right? Yes. You, your mind has not had the time to uh, label and categorize everything that you see. So you could live in the most beautiful place in the world. Um, but uh, if, you know, you stop seeing it, you know? And yeah. your friend, you know, may come over to visit and, and, you know, they're taking pictures, you know, of your mailbox or the, the paint peeling on your neighbor's house right. or something, right? because they're seeing all this stuff and you stop seeing all of it. And when you travel, you, uh, you see for a little bit, you know, the first time, at least you see everything and you notice the colors and the textures and, you know, all the things that are different from what, and, and, and then after a while that, that becomes familiar and your mind starts categorizing and labeling and you stop seeing things so clearly. And that, that state of mind, um, I think is inherently pleasurable. It's, it's, you know, that, that being in that, you know, people call it being in the zone or being, right. um, you know, what are the, there's all kinds of, you know, being in a moment, whatever. I think they're all just kind of different, you know, terms for the same thing. It's that side of us that is, you know, it's the ideas and the vision and the, and the seeing, it's not the words. And being there, you know, I think is what inspired, you know, cavemen to, <laughs> yeah. to paint on walls and why, you know, every society, you know, produces art and it's just part of who we are as humans is, it's art is kind of the language of that side, you know, and then words are the language of the other side you know, of the logical side. And, and so when you travel, you know, you're in that moment for a bit, you know, and it feels good. And, 
you know, no matter what, you just remember it, you know, as something fun and pleasurable and something, you know, you like doing. And so it doesn't matter so much, you know, it's not always trying to get to the next most spectacular place, you know, it's just something that's different, you know. It doesn't matter if you're going to like, you know, Fresno or, or France. <laughs> right, right. You know, it can both be like very, you know, interesting, you know, to somebody who's never been there. So, but I do, I do love going, you know, to new destinations, you know, uh, started doing Africa a few years back and that's just, uh, you know, it's off the charts as far as like wildlife and that goes. Yeah, that's amazing. And very next, uh, later this month, I go to Patagonia uh for another workshop so uh, patagonia oh my goodness <laughs> it's yeah it's spectacular that was something my uh, second time there and uh, yeah I, I did a scouting trip right before the, the pandemic and then i had to cancel um the trip that was scheduled for that may of the of that or april of that pandemic so finally we're doing it now and uh, yeah i'm super excited about that you know later on i've got trips to Brazil and uh, my Churchill polar bears trip that I do every year. Yeah, I've got a lot of, uh, yeah, you've got a full calendar. Yeah. 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 Which is, you know, it's, it's my, you know, it's my dream. It's my, <laughs> been my that, dream. yeah, that is fabulous. So where can people find you? Where can people find out about your workshops and if you've got sure. books or courses or talks that, you know, because you've wow. shared so much for listeners. I think there's a wealth of things to take in. So, uh, so, so everything is at artofseeing.com. So uh, as in to see, um, and, um, you know, they click on the, uh, the workshops link there or, or you know, I, I, I've, I've blogged a little bit. So there's some, you know, there's some articles there. Um, you know, there'll be a little, if you go on that website, there'll be a pop-up for a, uh, like a PDF um, download that is uh, kind of like a scene 101. Nice. Uh, and, uh, people can download it. And hopefully they'll get something out of it. Yeah. Oh, I think they'll get something out of it. <laughs> and they'll definitely, if they want to contact you, they've probably got a spot on your website too. So that's the art of it's just art of scene, art of scene.com, correct? Right. It's, there's no the, it's just art. Yeah, of scene. that's why I took that up. <laughs> yeah. It's art of scene.com. Um, uh, and I think if you get close, it, Google will find me. <laughs> uh, you might Google Ken Lee, art of seeing, something like that. Um, but it's just art of scene.com. It's the easiest way to find out about everything I'm doing. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Ken. This has been a pleasure to have you and hear about all your upcoming adventures and share your thoughts on, on seeing the world and what's right around us in our backyard. So thank you. Well, thanks April. Thanks for uh, making contact and, and setting it all up.